It's been 2,000 years since the glorious light of the cross illuminated a world veiled in darkness and confusion about the character of God. And still today, the greatest need of mankind is a revelation of God's love as revealed in the life of Christ. Amazing Facts presents the Everlasting Gospel with Pastor Doug Batchelor. Coming to you each week from Sacramento Central Church in sunny California. Discover hidden treasures in God's Word today. A few weeks ago, I needed to fly down to Bakersfield for a meeting. And uh, I noticed that an awful lot of the reservoirs are low on water. And it's easy to see from the air because, you know, there you'll have this great big brown uh, chasm with a little bit of water at the bottom. And you can see what the water level should have been because uh, it's just dirt. And then you get the edge of the tree line and all this dirt and then a little bit of water in the bottom. And then uh, one of the members here took the boys and I out to Folsom Lake uh, a few weeks ago, and it was really accented. Now they're not even allowing a lot of activities out there because there's just not enough water. Now that was accented by a string of fires that we've had recently in California. And uh, I tell you, if you've got the combination of uh, low waters and high fires, you got trouble. Water is life. I was just impressed with the importance of it even in the Bible. If you're traveling through space, what is it that makes our planet stand out from all of the other planets? That's because two-thirds of the planet is water. I was looking at a definition. Water, a clear, colorless, odorless, tasteless liquid. Uh, they say it's tasteless in the definition here, but you get thirsty enough, it tastes pretty good. <laughs> H2O, essential for all plant and animal life and the most widely used of all solvents. You know, water is interesting because it occurs in three states. You've got uh, solid, liquid, and gas. And all three states of water occur in this planet. Now, they have found planets in the solar system where there's evidence of water, but they're all frozen. But on Earth, you can have it in vapor form. You can have it in solid form, such as ice in the Arctic regions. And, of course, liquid form, which is what gives life to our world. Someone had estimated that planet Earth has approximately 1.4 quadrillion tons, not gallons, 1.4 quadrillion tons of water. What's interesting is some of the scientists are wondering, how did it get here? Uh, they theorized that a, um, a storm of comets filled with ice struck the planet billions of years ago, of course. But uh, that's not what the Bible says. You know, even in the first few pages of the Bible, the word water appears over 700 times in Scripture. Uh, from Genesis to Revelation, you know, this is a, a blue planet. And from Genesis to Revelation, you can see the evidence of water in the Bible more than 700 times. For instance, the second verse in the Bible talks about water. In the first chapter in the Bible, 11 times there's reference to water. I mean, God is creating, and where there's no water, there's no life. I asked them to turn off the air conditioner for this sermon, so you'll really appreciate it by the end. <laughs> no. Water is life. You can find the rivers of God being created there in the first chapters of the Bible. In chapter 2, it says, From Eden there flowed a river. Evidently, this one river irrigated all of the planet, and it divides into four parts. That was, of course, before the flood. Now, when you read in the Bible about the journeyings of the children of Israel, water is especially important. I don't know if any of you have been to Israel. You know, one time it called it a land flowing with milk and honey. But sometimes deserts move. They migrate. 
Matter of fact, parts of the Sahara right now, the biggest desert in the world, they find evidence that at one time it was a land rich in water. They find engravings, they find places where the flocks and herds were, they find the bones of animals and evidence of swamps that have disappeared. And it was once lush, full of vegetation, and now it's desert. The land of Israel has experienced this desertification. That's a hard word to say. A land once flowing with uh, milk and honey turned into a desert. You know, there's a number of reasons for that. As you cut down the vegetation, it attracts less moisture and clouds from over the ocean. Do you know, at one time there was a, um, a Muslim king and he taxed the people in Israel based upon how many trees they had on their property. Now, if you're a landowner and you don't want to pay taxes, what would you do? They, they decimated the trees in the country. And the Romans, when they conquered Israel, in order to teach them a lesson, they sowed it with salt. And so it basically, it was like spraying Roundup on the country. It killed a lot of the vegetation, the trees were cut down, and it turned what was once a land flowing with milk and honey into a desert. But even back in the time of uh, Abraham, it was a fairly dry country in the summertime. Uh, something like California, if you, you wanted to get the idea. And especially in the Sinai wilderness, when the Lord brought the children of Israel through that desert, water was very important. First thing the children of Israel did as they left Egypt is they went through the waters. That was a symbol of baptism. This is typifying that for the Christian, when you leave the slavery of the devil, one of the first things we do is we go through the water. Because water is a, is a, a cleansing agent. We'll talk more about that later. They went through the sea. They were baptized in the sea. And then they came into this great desert. And evidently, they had to haul a certain amount of water with them when they left Egypt, knowing that they were going on a journey. It's always a good idea to have water with you. But water is life. Turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 15, verse 22. You can read about this first experience of a miracle of water. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now, I can appreciate what that must have been like. I used to live in a desert. And I've actually been lost in deserts more than once. I'm not bragging about that because it doesn't make me sound very intelligent. Um, I remember one occasion living in the mountains above Palm Springs. I went hiking with a friend. And he used to always have a big old jug of water in his backpack. And so we took off and I had a little backpack. He had a backpack and we went hiking all through the desert. We were looking for some new trails to go from Taquitz Canyon over to Chino Canyon. Dry desert mountain and, and we used to see how tough one another was. And whoever could go the longest without asking for a drink of water, that meant you were tough. And uh, so after hiking for hours without stopping for a drink, finally I couldn't take it anymore. I said, okay, I give in. Let's get a drink. He said, all right. Well, I'm wondering when you were going to say so. And I kind of looked at him and he looked at me and I said, well, I didn't, I didn't bring the water. You always have the gallon jug of water. I got some food. He said, I didn't bring any water. I thought you had the water. And so we're out there in this desert, just totally parched and out of water. And so then we thought, well, we're in trouble. We had food, no water. Well, we were, thought this canyon over here probably has some water in it. And so we thought we'd go to this other canyon, which was in the other direction of where we knew their water was, because it was shorter. We got there and there was no water. And now we're really thirsty. And it's the middle of the day in the summer in the mountains above Palm Springs. It gets to over 120 degrees. And uh, this is just one day no water. You know, they say you can live 40 days without food. One man on a hunger strike in Ireland went 80 days before he died from no food. You can live about three days with no water, and that's if you're still and you're shaded. One man in Mexico caught in an earthquake lived nine days without water, but he was in a moist area. But if you're in the hot desert, you can die in half a day. It just sucks the water right out of your body. They had no water. 
and they're people of cattle that drink water. And they knew they were going to die, their cattle were going to die. And so they, they came to Mara, they came to these springs, but they couldn't drink the water because it was bitter. It was either an alkali or a sulfur spring, but something that made it bitter. Riding around in the deserts of Nevada, every now and then you'll find one of these springs, and they'll even have a history marker there by it. How the wagon trains would come across and it would be bad or poison water. You can't drink it. What a disappointment to be that thirsty, to find some vegetation and think, oh, there's a spring there, there's an oasis, and to go there and to dip in and just spit it out. As much as you want to drink it, you know it'll kill you. It's like people who are lost out in the ocean, they're floating in water and they can't drink the seawater, dying of thirst out there in the ocean. And so the people cried out and they didn't know what to do. So Moses prayed to the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree. Now we don't know exactly what the tree was. God turned those bitter waters to sweet water. And that may have been an acacia tree like this one here that they find out in the Sinai deserts. Doesn't tell us what tree because I think it's more important that tree was a symbol of something. When you read tree in the Bible, Jesus died on a tree. It says in Acts chapter 2, whom ye hung upon the tree. That's crucifixion. In order to see Jesus, Zacchaeus climbed the tree. That tree cast in the water represents the, Christ, the cross of Christ that makes that which is bitter sweet. And it says, he cast this tree into the water and the waters were healed and they were made not just drinkable, they were made sweet. Now, that doesn't mean it turned into Kool-Aid, but it was sweet, clear water that they could drink. It makes me think of the story in the Bible when the, there was a famine in the land and they had this spring that they couldn't do anything with it because it was bitter alkali water. And Elisha put some salt in there and those bitter waters were made sweet. And I've drunk from that spring there. It's still running today there outside of Jericho. So God healed the waters. Now that's not the only experience the children of Israel had when they were dying from thirst. Back in 1921, the British used to own the country that we call Palestine. Now Palestine really has nothing to do with the Arabs that live there today. The real Palestinians are Philistines. As a matter of fact, the name Palestine comes from the word Philistine. It was the land of the Philistines. The people that we call Palestinians today are not really Philistines. They're Arabs that uh, live in that land. But in the country before it was divided, the British occupied that, uh, the land of Palestine and uh, what we call Israel today. And some soldiers, a unit of soldiers in 1921 got lost in a terrible sandstorm. It's a true story. We've used it as an amazing fact before. Out in the wilderness there, out in the desert. And they wandered for days. They ran out of water. They were dying of thirst. And in desperation, they said, let's see if we can dig in the sand and find some water. And so they dug and they dug, but they just came up dry. There was nothing there. And as they were about ready to completely give up, one of the soldiers looking off in the distance he saw this great rock outcropping and he said you know this is the country that the children of Israel wandered in and I remember reading in the Bible when I was a boy that Moses struck a rock and water came out he said we might find some water in those rocks over there and they stumbled over to this rock outcropping and one of them still had a pick and they began to pick away and you might think this is a crazy thing to do, but when you're desperate and you're dying, you'll try anything. And they began to pray and they began to pick just into the rock out in the desert. And would you believe that they chipped off some of that limestone rock and all of a sudden water began to seep out? And those men were able to get enough water out of that rock to revive them all and keep them alive. You know, it doesn't take a lot of water if it's steady to keep you alive. I'll tell you a little later about digging springs out in the hill. I've got a neighbor that was so excited. He started digging around and he found this little seepage coming out of the ground. And he was able to capture that and he ran it from a pipe and he ran it into a jug and it came to about one gallon a minute. Now that may not sound like a lot when you turn on your spigot at your house. 
it runs a lot faster than a gallon a minute. But if you get one gallon a minute, if you get half a gallon a minute, you get 700 gallons a day, actually more than 700 gallons a day. One gallon a minute is about 1,440 gallons a day. Now, do you use 1,440 gallons a day? Can you see how just a little bit, a little trickle of water in the desert, if it's constant, it can keep a whole unit of soldiers alive? They did that. They picked there and they found the water and it kept them alive. And that brings us to our other story about water from a rock. Turn in your Bibles to Exodus 17, verse 1. This was not the only time that they needed water out there in the desert. Exodus chapter 17. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord. And they camped in Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses, and they said, Give us water that we might drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses, and they said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? And Moses cried out to the Lord. So when they needed water, you notice what they do? Twice now it says they cried out to the Lord. This is going to make sense before we're done. So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, What shall I do with this people? They're almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand the rod with which you struck the river. And go, and behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb. And you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people might drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel, because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? They were questioning God was among them because they were dying of thirst. You know, sometimes you get thirsty and it doesn't mean the Lord's not with you. What do you need to do? You need to pray for the water. You know, this is interesting because it makes me think of that verse in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 10, talks about Moses striking the rock and water coming out of a rock. And it says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4, and they all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that same, that spiritual rock that followed them, the rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now what does this mean? The rock that Moses struck, did he find some boulder out there in the wilderness and he struck it and water came out of that rock and as they went from place to place somehow they hoisted this rock with them? Or maybe the rock rolled and it followed them? You know, most scholars don't think that's what it's talking about. When it says the rock that followed them, it's talking about the water that came from this rock followed them. Uh, Adam Clark in his commentary sums up what the Jews believed the ancient Jews believed the streams followed them in all their journeying. So Moses struck that rock and as they journeyed through the wilderness, miraculously, the stream just continued to follow them wherever they went. There was the water that was flowing from God. It failed one time and God gave them the opportunity to see if they trust, but they lost faith again and they complained. And that's when Moses got upset and he struck the rock twice when he was only supposed to speak to it. But the rest of the time, God had, uh, had this stream evidently following them through the wilderness. It says, when they came to the camp, the waters formed themselves into cisterns and pools. And the rulers of the people guided them by their staves into rivulets, into the various tribes and the families. And this is the sense that they give to Numbers chapter 21, 17, where it says, spring up a well. Wherever you go, wouldn't it be nice to know that you've got rivers of water following you? And the Bible says in Psalm 1, Blessed is the man that walks in the counsel of the ungodly, that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season. A man of God is like what? Someone who's planted by the waters. What does the good shepherd do? 
Second verse, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. You know, water cleanses and it protects us. Water cleanses. That's what baptism is a symbol of. People go down in the water and it's a symbol of the old life is washed away. And it's also a symbol of new birth because water not only cleanses, water protects. Your brain is encased in a menges of water and it's protected. That's why you get bonked on the head with a normal bonk, you'll be able to resist it because that water is protecting and the water cleanses. It's a solvent that purifies. And all this ties together because Jesus says that he's offering us that living water. Christ is that water that cleanses. He is that water that protects. You know, in the Bible, meetings often happened at water. I think it's interesting that uh, you find the story of where was it that Rebecca was tested to be a mother in Israel? It was at the well. And the test was, will she give a drink to me and will she water the camels? That's what Eliezer set out. It was a, a test about giving water. She's a type of the church there. Church is supposed to dispense the living water to a thirsty world. Amen? Amen. Where does Moses find his wife? It's at a well. The shepherds were striving with the daughters of Jethro. And Moses delivered them, and he helped them water their flocks. How is it that Jacob meets Rachel? There at a well. He uncovers the, the uh, mouth of the well that they might be, um, their sheep might get their water. And then Jesus meets the Samaritan woman there by the well. We'll talk about that. J uh, John chapter 4, verse 7. This was in our Sabbath school lesson too, but I didn't plan it that way. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. You know, it's interesting that Jesus would say, give me a drink. Is Jesus thirsty? What is it that satisfies him? That is, people might dispense living water to others. You remember after this woman accepts Jesus and brings others to him, he tells the disciples, I've got food and water that you don't know about. It satisfies Jesus. When he was on the cross, what did he say? He was thirsty. She said, why are you, a man who is a Jew, asking me, a woman of Samaria, for a drink of water? We're not supposed to have any dealings with each other. He said, oh, but if you knew who I was, you'd ask for me living water. She's still thinking about the earthly kind of water that I've been talking about so far, and he's now transitioning to a different kind of water. Blessed is him who hungers and what? Thirsts after righteousness. Are you thirsty? What is Jesus thirsty for? Righteousness among his people. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Are you thirsting for that? Like you're thirsty for water? How bad do you want it? You ever have that longing? You remember when David was in the cave of Adullam and you feel sorry for David because here he was a shepherd as a boy. He'd lived out in the open fields. He was able to freely, whenever he was thirsty, he'd just run and he'd drop this bucket down into the well of Bethlehem. He'd get himself as much as he could possibly drink and that well is still there today in Bethlehem. And now he's running from King Saul and he's living in a dark cave and he's out in the the badlands where they've got the bad water and one day he just longingly says oh if I could have a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem just kind of talking out loud three of his soldiers they loved David so much they went all night long to the city of Bethlehem where the Philistines had a, a garrison a contingent of soldiers there and they fought their way past the soldiers two of them cutting and slashing and they lowered down this pitcher and filled it back up and brought it back to David, risking their lives just because he was longing for a drink of the water from that well. You ever been somewhere where the water's bad and you miss the water that's good? You know, one of the things that, that I do is I travel around, I drink a lot of water. And uh, when I go to a hotel in the town, 
I take the hotel cup that they provide. I understand that's not always safe. And I taste their tap water. Believe it or not, some of the cities that are tested with the best water, you wouldn't think so. New York City is supposed to have comparatively good water. You would think it'd be terrible there. And there's some places you drink the water and, oh, it either tastes like copper or it tastes like sulfur. Some, you ever been in some of those places where the water smells like rotten eggs? Or have you been in those places where people got water in the bathtub and all the appliances are brown because there's so much iron in the water? It always tastes like you're drinking rust. And you, you put up with that for a while and you start longing like David for a drink of the water from Bethlehem. And you know when his soldiers brought him that water, he dumped it out. He said, you know, you've risked your life to get this for me. I'm not going to encourage that. This is an offering to the Lord. And uh, they loved David for that because he, he didn't want them to jeopardize his, their lives for him. So here Jesus is saying, I'm willing to give you this living water. I picked up, some of you are at Redwood Camp Meeting. You heard me tell this story. On my way to Redwood Camp Meeting a few weeks ago, I was driving uh, up this long stretch of road between Ukiah and Willits. There's a big, long hill there. Halfway up the hill, I saw this man. He looked like an older man because he had gray hair and a gray beard, a little bit heavy, had a jacket on, and it was one of these 100-degree days, and he's walking uphill. And I thought, you know, I often pick up hitchhikers. I thought, he probably needs a ride because there's no town. I know the area. There's nothing between those two cities. But I was in the wrong lane to pull over, and there were truck cars around. I couldn't pull over, and so I went zipping on by, and I said, well, maybe someone will give him a ride. And, and the Lord said, Doug. I said, Lord, I'm going to camp meet. I'm late. Doug. You ever have the whole, he didn't hear it audibly, but you know what I mean? And I said, well, but Lord, there's this concrete barrier. I don't know where I'm going to turn around. There's a concrete thing between the lanes. You can't just flip a Yui. And so I thought, all right, I, I'm not going to be happy unless I do. And so I go up the road. I keep waiting. I had to go up the road quite a ways. And finally, I found a turnaround. I turned around. I came back. And I saw the guy. But now there's still a concrete barrier. And I thought, oh, man, I don't know how far. I had to go like two and a half, three miles down the road before I could find another turnaround. Pick this guy up. I know I'll probably get no credit from God for this because I'm telling everybody else. <laughs> so, you know, it says, you have your reward. This is it. And so... I'm going to milk it for all I can. So I went all the way down <laughs> three miles, turned around, came back up again, and sure enough, the guy's there. I pull over. Boy, he was happy. And it wasn't a real safe spot to pull over. Fortunately, there was no traffic now. He jumped in the car, and the first thing he said, he didn't tell me where he was going. He didn't tell me who he was. He said, do you have any water? And I could see the guy was red in the face, and he was perspiring. He was older, and he, he had forgotten to take water with him, and he was walking uphill with all his clothes on. And, uh, it, I mean, he had a jacket and everything. And I thought, well, I do, but I, under my armrest, I keep two of those little plastic, about half the size of one of these. I felt bad. I didn't <laughs> have anything more. And I said, well, I do. And I gave that to him, and it wasn't as much as he wanted, but he just sucked that down in one drink. And God told me to turn around and pick this guy up. And he told me that he was a Christian. He was on his way to a mission. And he said he was dying of thirst. He said, I was praying that, that somebody would pick me up that could give me a drink of water. And that's why I felt that strong uh, impression that I was supposed to turn around and give this guy a drink. If Jesus knows when we're physically thirsty and he cares... If we pray and God cares about taking care of our thirst, if he's willing to make water come out of a rock for soldiers, then does he care if we're spiritually thirsty? Which thirst is more important? You know, they say that as you get older, the mechanism that helps you know that you're thirsty doesn't operate as effectively. And sometimes you'll see people who are older and their lips are dry and they forget to drink. You need to drink even if you don't feel like it. And that's also true of living water. You need to discipline yourself to drink water every day. First thing I do when I get up is I heat up water and I drink water. And I drink several glasses of water. First thing I do is I go into the bathroom, I drink water, I go downstairs, I drink more water, and I try to tank up for the day because you kind of dehydrate, especially in a dry climate during the night. 
And even if I don't feel thirsty, I know how much I need, and I make myself drink it. I keep bottles in my car. I've got them in my drawer at the office. We keep them here at the church. Just before I went on the platform, I said, Helen, get me some water. I, I wanted to be able to have you at least see that. You need to also discipline yourself about the spiritual water. You may not know how thirsty you are. You might be thirstier. Matter of fact, I can almost guarantee you need more than you're drinking. Have you ever heard someone tell you that before? They say you need, what is it, three liters of water a day? And of course, if you're in drier climates, I'm sure you need more. You need more spiritual water than you probably think. Jesus said if you invite him into your heart, he actually provides an artesian source of water that will spring up. Artesian wells are the best kind of wells. You know, I like reading the stories in the Bible about uh, when God provided this living water. In John chapter 4, verse 13, Jesus said to the woman, whoever drinks this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. You know, most water needs to be pumped or drawn, but it's really something when you find artesian water where it bubbles up to the surface. In Jeremiah chapter 2, he says here in verse 13, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water. And that word living water there means springing water. And they've dug out cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that can hold no water. You know, this is a problem is we all need that water. And Jesus is the living water. We're trying to get it by manual effort. He's offering it by divine. We try to dig it, and it's so wonderful if you can have it come on, on its own. You know, this has been of great interest to me. You may not get anything out of this sermon, but it's really interesting to me because uh, I've been thinking so much about water power. All the years up there at our place in Kovala, we've had solar power. We've never really been able to have water power. We tried it once, but 12-volt alternator turning a little Pelton wheel, because you lose so much electricity with 12 volts, you get very far from your house, the voltage drops. I tried it for a year and it just didn't work. But they now came out with a 110 volt alternator and a little Pelton wheel, and I've ordered one. <laughs> and we got lots of water, but it's at the house, and it runs away from the house. But now we can run water a quarter mile away from the house, and just the natural flow of that water, without it being pumped, is going to turn a Pelton wheel that will provide 112 volts for the cabin in the winter. Solar power is great in the summer, but in the winter you got weeks with no sun. And you got to run a generator for power. This gives you a power of natural water. It's wonderful. Most of the power in California comes from hydropower. Uh, I don't know, it's kind of nuclear and hydro, I think. But it's wonderful when just the power of water, the, the gravity of water gives you power. Jesus is offering us this naturally powered water. So I've been thinking so much about water lately. Then my friend told me he dug and he, he found this spring. Kind of made me want to go and start digging. So while I was up there this week, I talked to my buddy Dave, and uh, he knows our place pretty well. He said, Doug, you know, you got a patch of berries that's been there for 30 years. And wherever you got this spring grass, there's probably water there. And I said, oh, I've seen that. It's never gotten to be anything more than just mud. Well, I was talking to some friends, and something interesting happened. All these fires in uh, Northern California, he said, springs that have not run for years have started running in the places that have burned. Did you catch me? Springs, fire goes over some hills, and all of a sudden the springs start running. He said, what happens is there are springs in the hills, but when there's water, vegetation starts to grow. And the more and more these trees and these plants and things begin to grow down around the springs and they send their roots down, sometimes hundreds of feet down, and they're sapping up gallons of water every day. And you get an acre of land of trees and vegetation just soaking up all the water. It never reaches the surface. And all the trees died. They stopped drinking and the springs have nowhere to go. They start bubbling up again. 
He said, the water's there. You just need to dig for it. So I thought, well, I've got to try this. Oh, by the way, let me pause on that point for a second, friends. Some of you are dry right now in your lives because there's too many weeds that are growing around the spring and nobody knows that there's any water in there because it's getting all soaked up by these other things and you might need a fire to go through and clean it off so those springs begin to flow again. Sometimes God allows us to go through fiery trials in order to get the water running again. Did you catch that? And so I thought, well, I'm going to go check that out. And so I'm just talking two days ago, so I'm real excited about this. This happened after I picked the sermon title, but I thought that was providential. Dave said, Doug, you ought to check that out. And I called him up. I said, you got a couple of hours. Let's go see. I got a backhoe. Drove the backhoe. This, this berry patch has been there 30 years. It was been there hundreds of years. I never checked. It's above the house. If you find water running above the house, it's pretty exciting. So I started digging. That's me digging. Dave also helped me dig. And we started, first we had to clear out the berries. We got to get rid of the vegetation. We scraped all that off. There were some fir trees around there. They weren't too big, and so we pushed them over. We got a lot of fir trees, so don't, don't talk to me later about it. I'm not a tree hugger. And you see all the trees back there, plenty of trees. And so we, we got rid of the trees because they were soaking up the spring. Pushed them out of the way, scraped off the surface, and it was nice. All of a sudden, I mean, it's 100 degrees out. This is a dry time of year. Saw some wet ground. I thought, wow, this is great. So we started digging. And pretty soon I found a little bit of mud. I said, oh, this is great. We found water. And Dave said, don't stop there. He says, you got to get below that layer of clay. He says, there's a layer of rock underneath these hills. And if you get into the layer of rock, if there's water above it, you get to the layer of rock. So I went down eight feet. And he said, I said, look, this, I'm seeing a little water. He said, no, I'll keep going. And so I kept digging. And then we take turns. He kept digging. And pretty soon you put your bucket in, and it's the sweetest sound in the world. It's a slurping sound. You go, <laughs> and you hear that when you're digging a spring. That's like the hallelujah chorus. <laughs> if you're in the dry hills and you're dying of thirst and you hear, <laughs> that's a wonderful sound. <laughs> and the bucket went like that. And I took a picture. I was so excited. I wanted to show Karen. And uh, I took a picture and the water just began to pour into the hole. And you're probably thinking, Doug, I don't like you anymore. This is, you're just bragging about all your water that you got up there in the hills. This is good news, friends. I am so excited. It just doubles the water flow that can go to the bachelor pad up there in the house. And so, just be happy for me. I was so excited. I actually, you know what I did? I just wanted to see where it was coming from. And we dug it even deeper than that. And I hopped down in the hole. Don't ever do that. Kids, don't do that at home. I got down in this ditch. It was 12 feet deep at that point. I wanted to see where is it coming out. I wanted to put my finger in the spot where this miracle was happening. And I went down and I could see where it was gushing out from several places coming into the hole. And we took a picture. And then I climbed out. And a few minutes later, the whole side caved in. It just would have killed me if I was still in there. And so that wasn't very smart, but you already knew about me, right? <laughs> anyway, but I got so excited because now we're going we're gonna to end up developing. We know there's water there. Once you know there's water there, man, you can figure it out. You'll, we'll find a way to get it. We'll take the bulldozer or something like that. But it just was so exciting to see that water up there in these dry hills, especially when there's a drought. You know, the Bible tells us in the last days there's going to be a famine. What is it that usually brings on a famine? It's a drought. The days are coming, says the Lord, that there's going to be a famine. Famine for the Word of God. And it's a drought of living water that causes this famine. Now, I've talked a lot about uh, water. What is the living water? Is it, you know, you, we talk in terms, we talk in these symbols. What does the Bible say it is? Turn with me in your Bibles. John chapter 3, verse 5. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. How important is water? Jesus said, unless you're born of the water, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. That being born of the water has a couple of meanings. No, it does not mean being born of a baby. Some people think it means coming out of the, the, um, the, the water that a baby's in. 
the water sack, that's not it, because why would Jesus say that? He that is born of the water, you must be born of the water and born of the Spirit. How many here were born of a woman? Everybody's born of that water, right? It's talking about the cleansing of the Spirit on the inside and baptism, the cleansing of the Spirit on the outside. So it's talking about the new birth and the cleansing. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3. For I will pour water on him that is thirsty and floods on dry ground. Have you ever felt dry in your heart? I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. So what is this water? I will pour my spirit. What is it the church is supposed to be praying for in the last days? You've heard of the former rain. We're praying, for, praying now for the latter rain. And that latter rain is that water coming down represents a rain of what? the Holy Spirit being poured out on the church. And by the way, back in the days of Elijah, the Holy Spirit, or the rain came after God's people prayed. They humbled themselves before the Lord, and it's going to happen again. John chapter 7, verse 37, this was our scripture reading. On the last day of the great feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He that believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Rivers of water flowing out, an artesian supply of water. But this he spoke concerning the... You still got your Bibles? I'm reading. We always stop there. What is that water? This he spoke concerning the Spirit. So that living water is talking about God's Spirit inside that refreshes us from within. And Jesus picked the optimum time to do this. He waited for the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, it's not in the Bible, but the Jews had a custom back then during the feast where they would draw water from the Pool of Siloam. The Pool of Siloam was formed because Hezekiah had dug a tunnel. How many of you have heard of Hezekiah's tunnel before? See, back in Bible times, you could withstand a siege for quite a while. They could store food, but you had to have water in the city. And if your water was outside the wall, the enemy would block it and you couldn't get your water. So what Hezekiah had done, he had some brilliant engineers that went to the spring of Gihon outside of Jerusalem and they dug down, down to the source of it. They then dug a tunnel. They dug down within the city of Jerusalem and they dug towards each other. And how they did this back then with their primitive technology is absolutely miraculous. We don't know to this day how they did it. But they had teams going from two opposite sides, and we can see right now where they met because the pick marks are going like this in an arc on one side, and then you can see the pick marks going like this in the walls on the other side, and finally when they meet, they were only off a couple of inches. But they managed to meet and know exactly what depth and level they were outside the wall and inside the wall, and the water began to flow from the spring into the city, and it formed the Pool of Siloam. And that was like the lifeline of the city whenever Jerusalem was besieged, was that pool. And so they would take water from the Pool of Siloam, and they'd walk up the steps into the temple with trumpets playing and the people praising God. They'd put a little bit of grape juice in the water, which is interesting, the water and the grape juice from the side of Jesus when he was pierced, what came out? Water came from the side of Christ and blood, symbolizing that we're, we're washed by these, these things. He's washed by his blood, washed by the water. And then they'd pour it out on the altar. During that feast where there was this great ceremony of water, Jesus speaks these words. And he says that he offers us the living water. John chapter 7. If anyone thirsts, who? Anyone. Was that just anyone back there then? Or is that anyone here today? If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And we just quoted that scripture there in Isaiah chapter 44. But he spoke concerning the spirit. If you believe in him, he can give you that spirit that will cleanse your sins and that joy will be flowing out of your heart like it was with the Samaritan woman and so many others. Isaiah 58, 11, the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought 
and he'll strengthen your bones. You will be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. You know, it's wonderful to know that you've got a dependable source of water, especially if there's a famine in the land, and to have that artesian well to be available. You know, back in the days of uh, Abraham, everywhere Abraham went, he did two things. You know what those two things were? He built an altar to God, and he dug a well. Boy, he's a shepherd. He had a household with hundreds of servants. We know he had 300 that could fight in battles. This is actually a picture of a very ancient well that's in Beersheba, and they call it Abraham's well. And to this very day, it's got water down there, and uh, they argue that it dates back to the time of Abraham. It was one of his wells. Well, after Abraham died, the Philistines were afraid at how powerful he had become. They went around, they filled in the wells of Abraham with debris, with rocks, with dirt, to try to prevent the people of Israel from settling in that land. And uh, one of the things Isaac did is he went and he cleaned out the wells of his father Abraham. Everywhere Isaac went, he cleaned out the wells that uh, his father had dug. Here you've got Genesis chapter 26, verse 15. The Philistines had stopped up all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father, and they filled them with earth. Because where there's no water, there's no life. Trying to drive them away. What does the devil do? Does he try to plug the wells? Does the devil put all his weeds around the spring and try and soak up the water? He's trying to keep us thirsty. Genesis 26, 18, And Isaac dug again the wells of water that they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called them by the names that his father had called them. And Isaac's servant dug in the valley, and they fell a well. They found a well of running water there. What do you think that means? They were digging with their backhoe. No, they did it the hard way back then. They'd lower a guy by his feet down on his hole. He'd chip away until he couldn't stand it anymore. They'd pull him out, and they'd get another one. Can you imagine them chip, chip, chip? All of a sudden, you hear gurgle, gurgle, and he says, quick, get me out of here. And the water began to rise up of its own power and flow out of the well. It's wonderful when you get living water. It's, it's miraculous. Sometimes you wish you had x-ray vision. Some people claim to be able to water witch. They walk along with these uh, willow sticks or st iron and they try to say, where is the water? If you could only know where to dig. I'm sensitive about this. I know a couple of unscrupulous realtors that sold land to people and they said, I'm sure you can put a well in here. There's no water on the land. Oh, you can put a well in and there was no water, and they spent thousands of drilling, came up dry. And I know families that they, they put every penny they had into a piece of land, and then every extra penny into trying to get a well in, and they're now living on that land, and they're hauling water in barrels to wash their dishes, to take their showers, because there's no water. It's so sad. I mean, we take it for granted, living in a city like this. You turn the spigot, it may not always be that way. And I think sometimes we take Jesus for granted too. And we don't realize what a gift it is to have such an abundance of water for life, for our gardens, for our yards, for our bodies, for cleansing, for drinking. And Jesus says that he's offering us that water. The Bible begins by God creating a river in the Garden of Eden that irrigated all that life. And then you know you get to the end of the Bible in Revelation Chapter 22, verse last chapter of the Bible, you find this. He showed me a pure river of water of life. Water of life. Not only is there a tree of life, there's a water of life. Clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and from the Lamb. Water coming from God's throne and from the Lamb. In the middle of its street on either side of it was the tree of life. You know, it says in Isaiah 32, verse 2, a man will be as a hiding place from the wind and a cover from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. A man will be as rivers of water in a dry place. So how do we get the living waters? You know, there's a, uh, a story. I just heard it this morning on my way to church again. Uh, HMS Richard Sr. was sharing. I was listening to an old tape and he talked about during world, the Civil War, 
they had this notorious prisoner of war camp that was in Georgia called Andersonville. Have you ever heard the history or the story about Andersonville? It is, it's as bad as any story you've heard, or almost as bad, of concentration camp. I mean, at this point, at the end of the war, in 1865, the South had no food for their own soldiers. There was really no food for their prisoners of war. And they had so many soldiers stacked together in Andersonville within this one swampy uh, area that uh, they barely had a place to lay down. And they were dying like flies. There was a, a, a stream that came from the hills that kind of ran through the camp that really was the sewer. And that's all they had to drink. And finally it dried up. And there was this one summer when they were just dying, they had no water, they had no food, and all those northern boys gathered together and they had a prayer meeting. You know, back then, a lot of people went to church, a lot more than they do today. And they all came from homes, different denominations, but they believed in God. And they started to pray. And it was hot, the ground was dry, just the red clay there in Georgia. It was filthy and they just said, we need water. They're dying of thirst. And they had a prayer meeting, specifically praying that God would give them water. And right about the time that they were praying, a thunderstorm moved into the area and began to rain. Well, that was a temporary answer, but during the thunderstorm, lightning struck the parade ground in the middle of that prison of war camp, and where the lightning hit the ground, water began to spring up and it's still running today. It's called the Miracle of Andersonville, and it was happening as those soldiers were praying for water. Does God still answer prayer? If he'd save those British soldiers out in the desert when they pray for water, oh, by the way, we knelt down Thursday and prayed before we started digging that God would help us find water, and we did. So I'm excited about this. I think if the Lord cares about giving us that physical water, you know one of the last things Jesus says in the Bible? Last chapter of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, 17. Let him who thirsts come. Whosoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Isaiah 55 says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come ye to the waters. Jesus is offering living water to everyone, and yet people are dying of dehydration spiritually. They don't even know it. Why will you die? Why would you want to be so thirsty? If you ask God, he'll give you his spirit. He'll give you that living water. He'll give you that cleansing if you pray and you ask him. Does Jesus care if we're thirsty? Yes, he does. Look at all the miracles he did to satisfy physical thirst. Does he care about our spiritual thirst? He'll give you that living water. He said, if you ask him. That's what he said to the woman at the well, if you ask him. Would you like to ask him today that he gives us that living water? Let's stand. We're going to sing together. 432, I believe that's the right number. We're going to sing about shall we gather at the river. I'm hoping to gather by that river in heaven. Amen? And there, there's streams that flow today. Let's sing this together and then we'll pray. I think there may be some people that are thirsty here today, and I'm not just talking about physical thirst. I actually went to the store yesterday and thought about buying a whole pallet of bottled water and having them out in the foyer, but I just thought about it. I didn't do it <laughs> because I wanted you to tangibly think about drinking that spiritual water that Jesus is offering you, and I wanted to save the environment from all those plastic bottles. That's why I didn't get it. But there may be some of you here today that uh, you sense that inner thirst.
you know the need for the Holy Spirit. Maybe you have not experienced that cleansing that Jesus offers, that new life on the inside. Without water, there's no life. It's true in the physical world. It's true in the spiritual. And you'd like to have special prayer that you can receive that living water. If you have a need and you'd like to come for prayer, why don't you come as we sing verse 3 together. Father in heaven, Lord, we are so thankful that you have sent a virtual fire hydrant of water into our lives through Jesus. Lord, we praise you and we thank you. We know that Christ, when his very heart was pierced, the water flowed out, that it might irrigate the souls of everybody that asks, that everybody that believes can have that refreshing. Lord, I pray that you'll work that miracle right now. Do right now, Lord, for those that are here, for those that might be listening and opening up the ground and providing water, Lord, in a miraculous way. You did it for Hagar when she wandered in the wilderness. You did it for Samson when he was dying of thirst. And we believe that you'll hear our prayer today. We pray that you'll send your spirit, that living water, send the latter rain on your people. There's a famine in the land, Lord, and we need life. Bless us in our church. Be with each person who's come forward with a special request and help them to believe and to experience that refreshing. We thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.